After nine years of counseling in crisis pregnancy centers, I found it really difficult to continue to listen to girls say to me day after day after day, I really wish someone would have told me that, that this would be the consequence of the choice that I was making. My hope through these series is that you'll understand that every choice that you make has a consequence, either for good or it's something that's going to hurt you. And it's really important that you take the time as you make such critical choices, especially when it comes to your sexuality, that you understand all of the consequences. You're given so much information from the media and from other places, and, and maybe you haven't quite heard the whole truth. And we hope, and our hope is, that today and throughout the sessions, that you'll begin to open your eyes to the reality of the consequences of every choice that you make and be able then to make some good choices for yourself and for your future. Let's begin. I've been speaking full time for about four years. I currently speak to about 250,000 high school and junior high students all over the country. And I've learned a lot from the students that I've spoken to these last four years. I hope that today you'll learn something from me, but maybe more importantly, I would like to hear from you and, and would love to give you an opportunity to, to write, to talk to me, to ask questions. And we're gonna get an opportunity to do that here later. But, but I really hope that you'll be able to take something from this back with you and, and that it will change the way you think and hopefully then change the way you act. Before I began speaking full time, I spent nine years counseling in crisis pregnancy centers in Chicago and in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And for nine years, I'd have girls in my office and these girls would say to me, Pam, if I would have known that this is what was gonna happen to me, I would have made a different choice. Nobody told me. I began to ask these girls in my office, what could we have said? What could someone have said to you before you made your choice that might have helped you to have made a better choice? And after nine years, I realized there were a lot of students out there making choices about sex, having absolutely no idea what the consequence of that choice would be. So we're going to talk about today. I want you to understand that I didn't come to your school to decide for you what you're going to do about sex. It's not why I'm here. I can't make this choice for you. I understand that. Your parents can't make this choice for you, although I'm sure there are a few of them that wish they could. I've already told my 10 and 11 year old at home that when they turn 12, I'm putting them in a box, locking it and feeding them through a window till they're 19. <laughs> then I started speaking at colleges and had to up my age to 24. I'd love to protect my kids from the pain I have to see every day. Can't. All I can do is love them, tell them the truth, Hope they make good choices. My goal this morning is this, that none of you would be able to leave here and ever again have to say to a physician, to a counselor, to your future husband or wife, nobody told me. I didn't know. Today you're going to be told what you choose to do when you walk out of here is up to you. But we're going to take this short period of time to think about one of the most important choices you have to make as a young person. Let me start by saying this. God created sex. It's awesome. It's a great thing. God wants you to have awesome sex. He does. He made it. He created it. He can tell us how to use it. See, but God created sex with boundaries. And when sex happens within the boundaries for which it was created, it's awesome. When it happens outside of boundaries, it's horribly destructive. It's kind of like fire. Fire in my fireplace at home in Minnesota is a good thing. Heats my house, looks pretty. Fire in the middle of my living room floor, however, is not a positive thing. It could burn my house down and hurt my family. It has to have boundaries. Sex is the same way. You guys tell me today, what's the boundary God created sex for? It's the boundary. What do you think? Marriage, there's the right answer. A lot of you don't believe that. I've had church kids in my office, kids who went to confirmation, went to church every week. I've had those kids in my office look at me and say, but we loved each other. So, God didn't create sex for love. 
That's not the boundary. God created sex for one context and one only, and that context is permanent lifetime commitment. Marriage, not love. Now, sometimes in marriage there's love. That's helpful. <laughs> sometimes there's not. Not the criteria. Fourteen years ago, I walked an aisle and I said these words to this young man whom I loved. You and you only. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health till death do us part. I was brain damaged. So was he. Guess what we got? Sicker, poorer, and worse. It's what marriage is all about. Sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> Somehow before we get married, we think marriage is going to be happily ever after excitement, heart-pounding romance, one big long date. And I know why you guys think that, because you look at your parents' marriage, and that is the most romantic relationship you have ever known, right? You know yours is going to look like that. <laughs> I got married, thought it was going to be one big long date. My marriage didn't look like that. I looked at my husband one day and said, my goodness, it's got to be you because I'm the most exciting thing that ever lived. Obviously, if there are problems in this marriage, it is your fault. Maybe if I dumped you, got a better guy, I'd have a great marriage. You know what? My marriage has problems. I'm in it. Someday when you get married, your marriage is going to have problems because you're going to be in it. There is a God and you're not him. <laughs> you're not perfect person you marry isn't going to be perfect. I didn't say if. I didn't say I'll stay married to you if you treat me the way I expect to be treated. Put your socks where they belong and if you don't gain 500 pounds in the next 10 years. I didn't say that. I said I'm committed to you for the rest of my life. Students, that's a safe context for sex. Not love, not mushy feelings, commitment. See, because if you're going to open yourself up so completely, so intimately, if you are going to give everything you are to somebody else, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, if you're going to become one flesh, you better know that they're not going to walk away. Because if they do, you'll pay. You'll pay. There's a cost. What we're going to talk about today is that cost. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. And then we're going to talk about some boundaries that we can put in place to help us say no until we're in a marriage relationship. If you forget everything, I tell you, and there's only one thing you can remember from me. This is what I want you to hear. If you have sex outside of marriage, you're going to pay. No one has ever had sex outside of marriage and not paid. The question we're going to ask is, what's the cost? And is it worth paying? Physical cost. What are most teens who are having sex afraid of? What's our biggest fear? Pregnancy is exactly right. Pregnancy is the biggest fear of teens having sex today. That doesn't make any sense to me. Got a news flash for you today. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's survivable. You can live through that. I've had girls in my office for years. They're all scared. They're waiting for a pregnancy test. I walk in, look at this girl, and say, your test is negative. She gets this look of relief over her face, like, I'm off the hook. I'm not pregnant. Let me out of your office. Wait a minute. Have you been tested for syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomus, vulvodynia, arthritis, hepatitis B, HPV, HIV? Have you been tested for these diseases? Me? I would need to be tested for that. You're in my office thinking that it's possible you could be pregnant and you don't think you could have a disease? Students, you have a four times greater chance of contracting a disease today than you ever have of being pregnant. And yet pregnancy is what you're worried about. Girls, you actually believe that that time of the month can come around, you know, and you can just kind of go, oh, four more weeks, I'm off the hook. Really? As if pregnancy was the worst thing that could happen. Pregnancy is survivable. I can walk you through that. I won't kill you. There are far worse things than that. However, over nine years, I've had to tell a lot of young girls that their test was positive. Immediately, this girl wants an easy, painless way out of this pregnancy she didn't plan. I have to look at this girl and say, guess what? Your choices at this point are bad, terrible, and even worse. Those are your options. You had a good choice. That was before you had sex. Now, all of your choices are going to carry lifelong consequences. No easy way out. Abortion's painful. I've counseled hundreds of women, 5, 10, 15 years after abortion, still hurting. I've counseled teen girls with anorexia, bulimia, depression, suicide because of an abortion they couldn't take back. I was in a Catholic high school in Gary, Indiana, spoke at chapel, got done. 
And a 10th grade girl chased me down the hallway of her school in tears. She said, Pam, three weeks ago, my mom dragged me to an abortion clinic. I haven't forgiven her. I can't forgive myself. I've done everything I know how in the last three weeks to take away this pain, and it won't go away. I looked at this 10th grade girl in the hallway of her high school, and I said, Jesus died for you. And there is no sin. There is nothing that you could do that his blood won't cover. And if you'll ask him to forgive you, my Bible says that he'll throw your sin as far as the east is from the west. Remember it no more. She asked Jesus to forgive her, and I believe he did that. But you know, there's a birthday that won't happen that this girl will never forget. And there are tears that probably won't be completely dried until she sees Jesus someday. Abortion hurts women. Parenting is not an easy choice. I had a 13-year-old deliver a baby a few years back. She started the eighth grade as a parent. It's going to be a lot of difficult years ahead for her girls. Eight out of ten teen girls in this country who choose to parent their children will live below the poverty level for at least ten years, most of them for the rest of their lives. And nine out of ten teen girls who choose to parent their children today will never attend or graduate from college. Nine out of ten. And ten out of ten of those girls sat in my office and said, well, not me. I'm going to finish high school, go to college, work full time, be a doctor. Life happens to most of these girls. The number one indicator of poverty in this country has nothing to do with race or where you live. The number one indicator of poverty in this country is single parent households and the age of that parent when they began single parenting. Long-term consequences to a choice like that, girls. Guys, in case you've fallen asleep because we're talking about pregnancy and you don't think this involves you, you get a girl pregnant in this country whom you are not married to. All 50 states, if you get a girl pregnant whom you're not legally married to, you need to understand that you have absolutely no right to the choice she makes. She can do whatever she wants. You have no say. If she decides to parent... However, guys, you now have legal responsibility. It's costing us over $30 billion every year to support teens parenting their children. We finally decided we can't let these guys walk away. Over the last couple of years, our country's been undergoing what we're terming as welfare reform. And last spring, the paternity laws just got teeth. We are today requiring in all 50 states the social security numbers of both parents on every birth certificate of every child born in this country. No longer will girls be allowed to say, I don't know who the dad is, don't want to name him. We will have your social security number. Only other, under extreme circumstances will that not be the case. Guys, if you are named as a father of a child, you'll be notified typically by your county. Send you a little note, tell you you've been named as the father of such and such a child, born to such and such a person on this date. You'll have a period of time, anywhere from 60 to three to four months, to show up at the county and say, it's not me, it's not me. You'll be given a paternity test. If, in fact, it proves that you are not the father, they're going to go back to mom and say, sorry, try again, until we have someone's social security number on that birth certificate. Why did we change the law, guys? So we can uh, send you a little note when your kid starts kindergarten? Why? What do you think? So people can't, like, be deadbeat? Well, what are we looking for? That's right, we're looking for money. Right? That's how we track your income. Guys, it's going to cost you over the next 18 years between sixty dollars and $80,000, and your pay will be garnished. If you are not working, you'll incur debt. And when you do get a job, it's going to come out of your paycheck. This is not a bill. The state of California will politely ask you to pay. This is going to come out of your paycheck before you ever see it. I was in a nice little northern Minnesota town speaking to a high school up there, small town. I got done speaking at this high school, and a senior guy got up in front of all of his classmates, told them all for the first time that he was a father. It was a girl vacationing in their town the summer before. He had no intentions of continuing that relationship, and nine months later, he's a dad. He's allowed to see his daughter one weekend every three months. That's when they can arrange transportation. But he's being required by the state of Minnesota to pay $350 a month to support his infant daughter. It's based on his current income. He's working at Burger King looked at Sean that day and I said, Sean, if you had anything at all to say to the guy sitting here about what you learned, what'd you say? Anything at all. Sean said two words, don't drink. He said, I made a decision one night drinking I wouldn't have made sober and I'm going to pay for that 
for the rest of my life. Not only will Sean pay, but so will a little girl from Minneapolis, so will their daughter, and so will every other relationship either of them have for the rest of their life. Girls, you want to marry a guy someday who's got 350, 400, 500 bucks a month going out of your family income to pay for a kid he had in high school he thought he could walk away from? It's a serious responsibility, young men. You better think about that before you have sex, because after, if you're not married today, is too late. It's too late. Third option a young girl has if she finds herself pregnant she didn't intend to be, which I happen to think is the most positive option available to girls today, but it's not without pain. It's going to carry consequences. It's adoption. It's the ability of a young girl to take the child she's carried with her for nine months and loves with everything she is, to say, I want what's best for you, and I'm not it. And I'm willing to go through this pain to give you a family. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of maturity, and a lot of love. Not an easy choice. Two million requests for adoption will go unanswered this year. Two million couples who would love to be parents who won't be. Girls, please hear this because this affects you. Infertility, the inability to have children, has risen over 500% in the last six years alone for reasons we're going to get into. You find out later in your life that you can't have children for whatever reason, chances you'll be able to adopt an infant in this country aren't good. Average adoption today takes between 8 and 10 years and costs between ten dollars and $20,000. There aren't infants available today. It takes a lot of love for a girl to give her child a family and then to give that couple the privilege of being parents who otherwise might not be. 33 years ago in Michigan, a young 15-year-old became pregnant. She had a lot of difficult choices to make, maybe more so than some girls. She was raped. Abortion was legal in the 60s for rape in Michigan. This young girl chose to give her child life and then to place that child with an adoptive family. And that child was me. My biological father is a rapist. I don't even know my nationality. But I am still a human being. And I still have value. And my life isn't worth any less than yours just because of the way I was conceived. And I did not deserve the death penalty because of the crime of my father. And I've heard the rhetoric. And I've listened to people say, every child, a wanted and planned child, you're a mistake. I don't believe that. I believe that every child is wanted by someone, and I believe that God in his mercy, and I may not ever be able to explain it until I see him someday face to face, but I believe that God had a plan for me. See, I believe my God is so awesome that he is capable of taking your worst pain the shambles of either bad choices you've made or the damage others have done to you. And he is able to make something beautiful come from that if you'll give it to him, if you'll give it to him. I've not met my birth mom someday, I hope to. If I don't meet her here on earth, I'm going to meet her in heaven. I've been praying for her since I was four. And someday when we meet, I'm going to wrap my arms around her and I'm going to tell her I love her because she loved me. She loved me enough to give me my life. And then she loved me enough to give me the next most special gift I was ever given, and that's my family. I don't know where I'd be today if she'd tried to raise me. And I'm so thankful she loved me enough to give me a family. Students, I came to your school today because I wouldn't want any of you sitting in here to ever have to make a choice like this. I've spent nine years of my life walking girls through these choices, and let me tell you right now, there is no easy way out. The best choice is before you have sex. After that, your choices are going to get really tough. But hear me today. If you, someone you care about, were to find yourself pregnant, you didn't intend to be, please get some help. Don't make a choice like this alone. Make sure you find out where the Crisis Pregnancy Center is close to you, where there's help, someone that can help walk through this, this crisis with you. Don't go through it alone. Pregnancy is survivable, though. We can live through that. That isn't the worst thing that could happen if you decide to have sex today. Far worse things than that. Today, in the next 24 hours, just today, 12,000 teens will contract a sexually transmitted disease. Today, 12,000 more tomorrow. 12,000 teens who got up this morning and said, like maybe somebody's sitting in this room, it's not going to happen to me. 
Pam, that happens in Minneapolis and Chicago and L.A. and really scary places like that, but it doesn't happen in our town. And we're okay over here. You're wrong. In the 1950s, we had five sexually transmitted diseases we knew about and were treating today, and we've got over 50. Over 25 of them are significantly prevalent among teens today, and 30% of those are absolutely incurable. That means you get one of these diseases and you've got it for life. Which is a lovely thing, guys, when you're getting ready to get married. You found this girl you love. This is it. She's the one you want to spend your life with. You pull out that diamond. You look her in the eyes. If you're really cool, guys, you'll get on your knees. You say, marry me. By the way, I've got genital warts. You'll get it, too. We'll both be treated for the rest of our lives. In fact, you'll probably end up with a radical hysterectomy, cervical cancer, and possibly death. But marry me. I'm excited now. Thank you for sharing. Right? I mean, isn't that what you'd want to have to tell the person you're spending your life with someday? Lovely. HPV, genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomas, vulvodemia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, list goes on and on and on. These are serious diseases. They have serious consequences. Chlamydia is one of the more common diseases among young teens. Chlamydia. This is a bacteria. It's not a virus. It's easily treated and cured. If we knew you had it, we could help you. Here's the problem. Most high school, junior high students who are having sex, here's what they actually believe. Actually believe that if you get up the next morning and herpes isn't tattooed to your forehead, you don't have a disease. If I can't feel it, see it, touch it, I don't have it. Here's the problem with most of these diseases. There are no symptoms. You can't treat a disease you don't know you've got. We've got thousands of teens out there having sex going, well, it's not bothering me. Oh, I don't have a disease, never been tested, but I'm sure I don't. You have no idea. Girls, can I say this to you? Girls, you contract chlamydia one time in your lifetime, and there's a 25% chance you'll be sterile for the rest of your life. Contract this bacterial disease twice, girls, it jumps to 50%. Contract chlamydia three times, and there's a good chance you'll never have children. That guy can break up with you, walk away from you, meet another girl, marry her, and have a family. And you are scarred for life. We got women in their 20s, early 30s saying, I'd like to start my family, I'm ready. They try, can't get pregnant. They go running to an infertility specialist. He checks and says, my goodness, you've got all the scar tissue in your fallopian tubes, your ovaries, your uterus. You have pelvic inflammatory disease. You had chlamydia. What? I had a sexually transmitted disease? Well, how could I have had a disease and not even know? It's too late. Girls, I can't even the score here. You're going to pay a higher price every single time. Please don't miss this. Girls, you have an open sexual system. He has a closed sexual system. You are easier to infect, and you are far easier to damage on a permanent basis. You have to release an egg from an ovary. It has to make its way through a fallopian tube. It cannot be scarred in any way. Conception takes place. That conceived egg now has to find a place along the uterine wall to attach itself. There can't be scarring or infection. We need to get nutrients. We have to house and feed this child for nine months, and then we deliver. He produces sperm. Not that hard. <laughs> okay? You're more complicated, girls. You're easier to... To, to damage. You hear that? Okay, you need to know that. And you know, even as I say that, I've traveled all over this country, and there are young men, I've met a lot of them all over the country with so much integrity who actually do care about you, the kind of guy that would look at you and say, you know what, I love you. And I might be able to walk away from a relationship like this without permanent physical damage, but you might not. And I wouldn't even take the chance on hurting you. I wouldn't even take the chance. Unfortunately, there are some guys who don't care. And as long as it doesn't damage them permanently, they're going to do what they can do and, and move on. Be really careful who you're dating, girls. Be really careful. I was in Atlanta for the Through the Roof campaign. We had 40,000 teens in the dome in Atlanta. It was awesome. I had a call at my hotel from a couple I'd met in the Atlanta area a few years earlier. They said, Pam, it's really important. We need to meet. Can we do this face to face? We want to talk. First time I met him, they said, Pam, we've got an agency, an attorney, a home study. We've been waiting eight years for a baby. If you hear about a girl who might consider placing, tell her about us. July, I got the call they'd been waiting eight years for. There was a baby girl for them. They were so excited. They went out, bought pink, decorated their nursery, brought their little baby home from the hospital. It was three days old. They named her Anna Grace. 
Next day, Anna Grace wasn't eating well, was listless, and she thought, maybe I'm a new mom. <laughs> I don't know what babies are supposed to be doing. She got scared, called her pediatrician. Doctor said, bring the baby in first thing in the morning. Monday morning, they brought little Anna Grace to the doctor. Chris is holding the baby. Angie's filling out all the paperwork. Looked over at her infant daughter, who began to foam at the mouth and stopped breathing. She was rushed to an emergency room in Atlanta, where she died six hours later. Anna Grace had herpes. 14-year-old birth mom, her name was Robin. She gave herpes to her daughter during vaginal delivery. It's fatal to infants within days or weeks. Robin came to the funeral, and in tears, she looked at Angie and said, I was in the eighth grade, and I went to a football game on a Friday night, and an 18-year-old kid took me behind the bleachers, and my life will never be the same. Not only did this beautiful little eighth grader get pregnant that Friday night, but she contracted a virus, herpes, which she will have for life which she'll give to her husband someday. She took the life of little Anna Grace. Students, just this week on the news, just this week the CDC released statistics that herpes has increased fourfold among teens and doubled among people in their 20s. There is no cure for this. Angie looked at me in tears. She said, Pam, please don't let our daughter die in vain. There are thousands of teens who have absolutely no idea it takes once. It takes once. Some of you sitting here are going to get a second chance to make this choice today. Some of you might not. And that's why it's so important you think about this stuff sitting here, not in the back seat of somebody's car on Friday night. Okay? HPV, human papillomavirus. This is also a virus. Contract this. You'll have it for life. Pass it on to everyone you have sex with after infection. This is the fastest growing STD among 16 to 24 year olds today. Also the most highly contagious viral STD we know. This is not transmitted the same way as HIV. We're going to talk about that in a second. HPV, human papillomavirus. Street name for this virus is genital warts. Basically, this is warts on your genital area that need to be burned off periodically, either through laser surgery or chemicals. We used to think that was the only big deal, you know. It's gross, you'd have to go back and have warts treated, until we realized a few things about this virus. Number one is this, you can carry and transmit this virus to a partner without ever having warts. In fact, the most cancerous strains of this virus, and there are over 50, the most cancerous strains of this virus don't produce warts at all. Girls. If you do get warts or lesions as a result of being infected with this virus, girl, typically they will be on your cervix. When was the last time you saw your cervix? Not a part of your body you can see, okay? I know when I'm in high school and I say genital warts, we got kids out there, and this is what their mind is going, well, I've had sex and she said that wart thing and I've never seen a wart. I don't have it. If you've not been specifically tested by a physician for this virus and you've had sex, you don't know that you don't have it. HPV is the number one causal agent of cervical cancer in women. It also causes cancer of the uterus, vulva. This is a very serious cancer-causing agent for women. We've got girls as young as 18, 19, and 20 undergoing radical hysterectomies because of cervical cancer. In fact, girls, more women died in 1995 of cancer-related illness due to this STD than died of AIDS. This sexually transmitted disease killed more women in 95 than did AIDS. And we're not talking about this? Not telling our daughters this? We're not wearing red ribbons on MTV for them? Most of them in their 30s. I used to think when I was your age, 30s old. I'll be ready to die. We all know there's not life after that. If you've not done what you need to do by then, hang it up. It's certainly downhill from there. Then I turned 30. Guess what? It's not that old anymore. What would it be like to find out you got cancer in your 30s because of choices you or your husband made in high school? You can't take back. I had a 10th grade girl stop me after an assembly, tears coming down her face. She said, Pam, three months ago I went to a party, I got drunk, had sex with this guy, I don't know where he's been, I'm really scared, what do I do? I said, you need to get tested, please do it today. If you can't get in to see your family physician today, you get in tomorrow, but you got to be tested. Don't continue to think that this isn't going to happen to you. She called my hotel that night in tears. She said, Pam, I have HPV for life. She'll pass this virus on to everyone she has sex with from this point on. Who knows what it'll mean to her ability to have children, cancer, we don't know. And in tears, she said this to me, I will never forget this girl. Why didn't you come to my school three months ago? Nobody told me this. I never even heard the words HPV before today. 
I hung up the phone, sat alone that night, and I thought, would she have heard me? Or, or would she have sat like hundreds of teens and still somehow said, it's not going to happen to me? Students, you think in 1997 that you could have sex with someone who's been with someone before you and not get a disease? Really? You're not playing the same game I was playing. You're certainly not playing the same game your parents were playing. If you would have graduated from high school in 1967, maybe some of your parents were in high school that year. 1967, graduating class, one in 32 of their classmates was infected with a sexually transmitted disease. 1981, you've been in high school with me in the early 80s. One in 18 of my classmates was infected with a sexually transmitted disease. In 1995, it was one in three. What are the chances now that you could be with someone who's been with someone before you and not get some disease? It's not possible. Hopefully, it's one we can treat. And when we're talking about this virus, human papillomavirus, not all the other diseases, just this disease, HPV, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is today estimating students that 46% of all sexually active singles 46% of the students at your high school who have already had sex are already infected with this virus. That's one out of two. And there is no condom in the world that will protect you from this particular disease. This isn't a disease of blood and semen. This is a disease of the entire genital area. All it takes is skin contact anywhere in the genital area and you're infected for life and will infect everyone you have sexual contact with after that. It doesn't take sex. I have had many girls in my offices test positive for both herpes and HPV who were technically virgins. They thought they could do everything else. See, what was their big fear? Pregnancy. See, so as long as I don't get pregnant, I can do all this other stuff and be okay. I'm going to answer the number one question I get from teens on the road because I know you'd be way too afraid to ask it, so let me answer it for you. Number one question I get on the road goes like this. Well, how far is too far? Well, then what can I do and still be okay? You know why you ask us that and you all do? You know why you Because you want us to draw you a little line so that on your second date, where are you going to be? All over the line, okay? All over the I'm afraid of heights. That's why I live in southwest Minnesota. There's not even an incline anywhere. <laughs> we could all go out to, to uh, Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon, take a big field trip. You might hang your toes over the edge and go, cool, you know, I'm back on the bus saying I can see just fine from here. Thank you. I don't need to get that close, okay? Question should never be how close can I get. It should be how far back can I stay. I'm going to give you the medical line, however, and I believe that you need to back up from this. But here's the line across which you can't step. And if you have, you're at risk. You need to hear this. You need to be tested. Here's the line. Are you ready? Absolutely no genital contact of any kind outside of one partner for life. None. You cross that line and you're at risk and you need to be tested. I had a girl come into my office one day for a pregnancy test. It was negative. I said to her, look, your test is negative. You need to come back. We need to do a pap smear, a blood culture, or a vaginal culture, and a blood test. When can you get in? Oh, no, not me. I don't need those tests. Yeah, you do. No, see, Pam, you don't understand. See, I have only been with my boyfriend, and he has only been with me. How do you know that? He told me. That's good. Did you ask the right question? See, it's not good enough to say, have you had sex before? No, have you? No, okay, we're fine. Not good enough. You need to know whether on any occasion this person has ever had any kind of genital contact with someone else besides you. If they have, you're at risk and you need to be tested. Is that clear? I'll give you a simple rule because I like things to be simple. Keep your pants on. Okay? Simple rule. If you do that, you're not at risk. So, you know, holding hands, that's really nice. A nice little kiss at the end of the day. Well, it's really cool. You're fine. Keep your pants on. If you cross that line, you need to get tested. Please do that. And then there's HIV, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this because, quite frankly, I think you've heard a lot. And, and, and the sad thing to me is you've heard so much about HIV that you, you don't even realize that there's all kinds of other diseases out there that are hurting people very terribly. But this is a virus, and it's an equal opportunity virus. It hurts the guys as much as it does the girls. We've never cured a virus in the history of the world. 
In light of that, what are we telling you to do to make sure you don't get this particular virus that will eventually kill you? I'm going to say two words. You've got to play this game with me. Are you ready? Here's the rules. I'm going to say two words, and I want you, when I say this, these two words, to say out loud, don't have to raise your hand, okay? Everybody participate. Out loud, the first thing that comes into your mind when I say these two words. This is a Freudian experiment. I don't want a paragraph. I just want one word, okay? And I want it to me, not to your neighbor. Are we all ready? Here we go. These two words. Safe sex. <laughs> That's the answer I usually get. You guys are really good. <laughs> hey, Pam, I don't have to worry about AIDS. I don't have to worry about diseases or getting pregnant. In fact, I don't even need to get tested. I'm using a condom, and it's safe. Anybody bother to tell you what the failure rate of that device is? I could show you research today to give you 30, 40, 10, 2, everything in between. We don't know. Biggest reason we don't know is we don't have the technology to test for this virus. Only the technology to test for an antibody present in your blood system at some point after you've been infected. What does that mean? It means if you've had sex, put yourself at risk for this disease, you could go down today and get tested for HIV, and you need to do that. Please do that. If that test today is positive, you've been infected with HIV, will eventually come down with AIDS and die. If that test is negative today, what does that mean? What do you think? That's right. It means nothing. A negative test means nothing. You may or may not be infected. It could take three months, six months, a year. They're now saying in four to six percent of cases, it might take up to three years before you test positive. And in that period of time, you could be infecting someone. How in the world can we have failure rates for a condom when it could take us three years? Difficult. We do have failure rates for pregnancy. That's easier. It only takes 10 to 14 days to test for that, and we've been testing condoms for failure for pregnancy a lot longer. Current failure rate for pregnancy is 10 to 30 percent. One in five teenagers using a condom will be pregnant within 18 months. How many days out of the month can you get pregnant? It's a biology quiz. Got to go back to biology. Think hard. It's about 1 to 3, 24 to 72 hours in any given month. How many days out of the month can you get HIV or any other disease? Every single day, 365 days a year. Tougher question today, are you ready? How many people can get pregnant? 50%, half, only women, correct? No matter what Arnold Schwarzenegger thinks, only women can get pregnant. How many people can get HIV? What's that going to do to your failure? You don't have to pass general math to figure that out. The sperm cell, which is one of the causal agents of pregnancy, so you're all with me. You there? Sperm cell is 450 times larger than an HIV virus in size. That's like the difference between a basketball and a BB. Go back to class. Everybody get your book open when you go back to class. I want you to look at the period at the end of a sentence. And when you see that period at the end of a sentence in your textbook, I want you to remember this. 300 million HIV viruses will fit in that space. How many will it take to infect you with this disease? It'll kill you. You're being told to use a condom? That it's safe? That you can sleep with whoever you want? It doesn't matter who they've been with. As long as you got a piece of latex, you're okay. Lost our minds, students. It's not safe. Never has been, never will be. See, safe sex isn't about latex. Safe sex is about a safe partner. And the only way that you can have safe sex is to not have sex, to marry someone someday who has not had sex before you and or is uninfected, and you have three years from the last time they had sex to prove that, and staying faithful to that partner for life. That's the only safe sex. And let me say, as I wrap this session with you, this. I know there are students who are, who are sitting here listening on tape who, who've had sex. And you might be tempted to think, well, you know what? It's too late. No, it's not. Please, you have the same choice as everyone else. You can walk out of here and say, it doesn't matter. I've already done it. going to keep on doing it. It's a choice you have to make. Who's to say the next time you decide to put this gun to your head, it doesn't go off? When are you going to begin to build discipline, control, integrity in your relationships? You could start that today. I had a little girl say to me one day, came up to me after an assembly. She said, I'm a recycled virgin. She said, I had sex back here 
when I was 15, but I said, no more. I'm not taking that risk. I'm going to wait until I marry it. I said, you know what's so awesome about that? Someday you're going to have to look at that guy and you're going to have to tell him you had sex when you were, when you were 15. You're going to have to rehearse your past. It is unconscionable to would be with someone and not tell them everywhere you've been. But she's going to be able to say for the last three years, five years, seven years, I've waited for you. And we're going to know what kind of permanent damage was done. We've had a period of years to make sure she's okay. Whatever you've done in the past, today you can choose to make better choices. Please do that. Please do that. For those of you who haven't had sex and have been teased and harassed, can I say this to you because you don't hear it from very many places? If you still have your virginity, you have something so special, so valuable. It's worth whatever it takes to get to your marriage with no past, no fear, and no baggage. And I know it's not easy. You've been laughed at. My senior year, senior breakfast, it was a proud moment in my life. I was voted by my fellow classmates most likely to become a nun. I made my stand clear in high school. It's worth it. Don't let the teasing get to you. You're the most valuable gift you'll give someone. Don't throw it away in a relationship that's temporary. Now we're going to talk about the spiritual consequences. What does God have to say about sex? God has a lot to say about sex. In fact, uh, it's one of the few topics that's discussed in every single epistle in the New Testament. God has a lot to say. And sometimes it amazes me when students think, well, you know, that Bible is just so old, it's not relevant. It is extremely relevant. There's so much there that is so still true for us today. I grew up in the church. I had some weird ideas about God. Some of you might have these weird ideas. I thought this. I thought God was bored one day and he didn't have anything better to do. So what he thought would be fun would be to make up a bunch of rules to make my life miserable. So he wrote the Bible, which we all know is a book of rules to make our lives miserable, right? That wasn't bad enough. We used to sing a song when I was little in church that went like this. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. I didn't hear the in love part. I heard the Father up above is looking down with lightning bolts, ready to go the minute I stepped out. That's God's job. Make a bunch of rules and then watch you. And if you cross the line, fry you. That's what I thought God was like, you know. God's not like that. God loves you. God wants to give you the best. He has already provided for you the best. And the question is going to be, are we going to trust him or are we going to say, God, I don't really believe you got the best for me. I I'm going to do it my way. This has been going on since the beginning of time. This is a common to man struggle. Did God really say you couldn't have sex until you were married? I mean, certainly he meant just make sure you're in love, right? He didn't mean marriage. Yeah, he did. You know why? It's simple. Are you married? Did you have to think about that for more than two seconds? No? Anybody? I mean, are you? No, okay? It's not, you don't have to be out on a date Friday night going, well, I don't know, does he love me? Does she love me? Is it, are we mature? Are we responsible? No, if you're married or you're not, it's simple. If you're getting married Saturday, you're not married. On Saturday, have at it. You know, it's a simple thing. Either you're married or you're not. If you're not married, don't do it. If you are married, go for it with the person you're married to. That would be helpful. Simple rule, okay? God's law has always been simple. We're the ones who jumble it up and make it all weird and whatever. God's law was simple. You're married, you can have sex. If you're not, you don't, period. The first response, and it's all of our first responses when we sin, is to run from God. I've seen this happen in youth groups all over the country. You got some kids, they're together with that youth group, they're hanging out, life is good, they're going to Bible study, they're participating. And all of a sudden, you know, youth leaders are going, man, where's Jessica? You know, she used to always come to Bible study. She used to be here. She used to be participating with her friends. And now she's like running. Well, you know what that's about? It's about Jessica messed up. And she didn't want to be around the people that were giving life stuff. And now she's got to run. And I got to tell you something. We usually run from the very place that help is available. The place where healing and grace is going to come to you is from God. Students, can I say to you right now, if you ever hope when you fall, and you make mistakes, and you don't trust God, and you screw up, if you ever hope to get up and to make different choices, the blame game is over. You need to be able to say, I did it, it was me, I own it. 
James chapter 1 is one of my most favorite chapters in Scripture. I love James. I'll tell you why I love James. First of all, I think if James were alive today, James would be like, like the, the typical hard-nosed drug rehab counselor. He's an in-your-face, smack-you-over-the-head kind of guy. He's not nice. He doesn't come around and say, I love you. you know? He's just like right in your face. That's why I love James. James in chapter 1 describes this whole thing we've been discussing, the sin cycle, the temptation, the not believing God, the, the, the making excuses, the whole thing is described in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 13, never when you have been tempted say God sent the temptation. Don't blame God. God cannot be tempted to do anything wrong and he doesn't tempt anybody. It's not God's fault, it's yours, okay? When you're tempted, when you're faced with that struggle and you're trying to decide what you should do or what you shouldn't do, it's not God, it's you. Own it, okay? Everyone is tempted. Each one of us is tempted when by our own strong desire we are dragged away and enticed. And after that desire, when we take our desire and attach that to anything that God didn't provide for us, what's conceived in me is sin. And when sin has come full term, what comes out of my life is death. Scripture doesn't say dead. It says death. When you take your strong desire, and by itself it might be okay, your strong desire to be loved, someone to love you, to have intimacy, your strong desire to, 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 to have relationship and even sex, that's okay. But when you attach it to something God didn't provide for you, see, God's provided for that strong desire to be met. But if you attach your strong desire to something else over here, what's conceived in you is sin. When you no longer trust God and you do it your way, what's conceived is sin. And when sin has come full term, it brings death. Problem with this is that the process of sin feels real good. The result is death, but the process feels real good. You have never been enticed by something that smelled bad and looked terrible. Never. Sin looks real good. That tree looked like life. It looked like it would meet needs. It looked like it was, it was awesome. But God in love said, that's a lie. Don't buy that. James says that each one of you is tempted. Each one of you. The Greek word there is ekastos. Uniquely. What tempts me might not tempt you. What tempts you might not tempt me. This is a really important deal because, you know, it's really easy when we start talking about sin and the way we fall and the mistakes we make. It's really easy if that stuff that tempts you, you know, it doesn't tempt me. I can like, well, God, you're biting that. You're tempted by that. That doesn't, ugh. <laughs> and then I think I'm really okay because I'd never fall for that. But you know what? I got stuff that you put in front of my nose and I'm going to bite it every time. See, God knows, Satan knows what my strong desire is. He knows how to tempt me. Satan knows every single one of you. And just because you might not be tempted by something and the person next to you is doesn't make their sin worse or yours any better. My sin stinks just as bad as your, yours does. My cesspool smells just as ugly as yours. And just because it might not be the same bait doesn't mean it's not the same end result. End result of rebellion and sin is death. Each one of you is uniquely tempted by when, by, when by your own strong desire you are dragged away and enticed. Students, can I say this with all my heart? God loves you so much. He wants you to have the best. He wants to give you life and life abundantly. Here's the problem. The enemy's out there with all this bait that looks so good and he knows how to get you and he knows what he needs to stick under your nose. And it becomes a really difficult thing sometimes to discern between bait and food. How do I know? How do I know if this is bait or if this is food? How do I make the determination? Students, the answer is right here. The answer is in God's word. The answer is not questioning. Not, well, did God really say he's holding out on you? The answer is say, God, what did you say? 
I want to know, you know what I've taught my kids? Two simple rules that I've taught my kids since they were this high and I have to live by them too. First rule is this, whenever there is a question about should I or shouldn't I, I don't tell my kids the answer. I say, what does the Bible say? 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 Not what's your opinion, not what does the television say, not what are they doing on Friends. What does God say? What does the Bible say? Next question my kids ask themselves, and we've taught them to. In fact, they even wear a little bracelet that reminds them. It says, what would Jesus do? W-W-J-D. Every time you're in a situation, you have to make a moral choice, and it's tough, and you don't know what you should do. What would Jesus do? Jesus went to the cross for you. He went to, to the cross to set you free from all this rebellion and sin that we all struggle with. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. Each one of us is uniquely tempted, us, tempted and all of us have fallen. There was a time in my life when I shook my fist in the face of a holy God and said, I don't need you. I don't need your rules. I don't need you to tell me how to live. I can do it my way. And in that moment, I deserved death. But God loved Pam Stenzel so much that even when I shook my fist in his face and said I didn't need to do it his way, he sent his son to die for me. And in that moment, when I finally took my sin and I said, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've not trusted you. I've not believed you had the best for me. I did it my way, and I want to say I'm sorry, and I want you to forgive me. He took my sin, threw it as far as the east is from the west, and he did something more than that for me. What Christ did on the cross, students, is bigger than just wiping your sin away. He credited the righteousness of Christ, the perfect sinlessness of Christ to me. When God looks at Pam Stenzel, he doesn't see my sin. He doesn't even see me. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Students, can I tell you something? When you finally get in touch with the rebellion and the ways in which you've shaken your fist in the face of a holy God, and then when you do that and you realize that God already paid the price for you, that he's already credited righteousness to you, that he is freely giving you forgiveness, complete forgiveness, you ought to be amazed. You ought to be amazed. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that I know that I can stand before a holy God someday, not because I'm so awesome, but because Jesus died for me and because I've accepted that free gift. I just want you today to think about that in your life. Was there a time when you finally recognized that what you needed more than anything else was forgiveness from a God who's already loved you and paid the price? Or are you still running bite and bait thinking it's not going to hurt you? His arms are open to you. Forgiveness is free. And when you're ready to come home and when you're ready to stop biting that bait, and to accept that love that's free, he'll be there for you. It's eternal. It's eternal. Let's close this part right here in prayer really quick. And I just want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes, and let's ask God to make it real to us. Father, thanks for today. God, I want to thank you right here that, that you loved us so much, that you didn't leave us to wonder what was right or wrong, but you told us. You made it clear. And God, I want to thank you even more than that, that you loved me so much that even when I couldn't keep that standard and when I did it my way, that you sent your son to die to take my place. Father, thanks for your forgiveness. God, I pray for every student here. I pray for that student that, that has been struggling with, with what they should do or shouldn't do, and maybe they haven't bought bait yet. God, I pray that you would encourage their heart, that they would hold on to you, that they would believe you, that they would trust you, that they would believe that you have something good for them if they'll wait for your timing. And God, I pray for those students here who've bought bait and who maybe have thought that it wouldn't hurt them. And, and maybe, God, there's a young person sitting here today who really thought that they've bought the bait so much that they're so hooked that they couldn't get free. God, I pray you'd make real to them that freedom is available to them today in you. Help us to always be amazed by your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you.